Uh, Secretary Kerry, the administration has publicly stated that you expect this deal is going to be rejected by majorities in, in both houses of Congress. You said that while winning approval of Congress would be nice, your goal is basically to convince enough Democrats to support the deal so that you can avoid an override of the president's veto. So as far as the administration is concerned, this is a, a done deal. But, but I do think it's important for the world, and especially for Iran, to understand that as far as the American sanctions are concerned, this is a deal whose survival is not guaranteed beyond the term of the current president. And by the way, I personally hope that the next president is someone who will, who will remove the national security waiver and reimpose the congressional sanctions that were passed by Congress, uh, because this deal is fundamentally and irreparably flawed. I believe it weakens our national security, and it makes the world a more dangerous place. And throughout this process, by the way, this administration, in my opinion, has repeatedly capitulated on some important items. The examples are endless. It begins by allowing a perception to be created that we were pressing for anywhere, anytime inspections, and now denying that that was ever part of the process or ever promised. And I understand all the disputes about the terms, but clearly there was a perception created among my colleagues in both sides of the aisle that we were pressing for anywhere, anytime inspections, including of potential covert sites. Then the snapback sanctions, I think, are also hollow. We have this complicated 24-day arbitration process that Iran is going to test and exploit over and over again. They realize this, by the way, that they know that once the international sanctions are gone, they'll be impossible to snap back. As your Iranian counterpart, Mr. Zarif, has bragged, quote, once the structure of the sanctions collapse, it will be impossible to reconstruct it. He also bragged earlier this week, by the way, that incremental violations of the agreement would not be prosecuted. No matter what happens, Iran will keep the more than billions of dollars it is going to receive up front, basically as a signing bonus. Iran will be allowed to continue to develop long-range ballistic missiles, ICBMs, that know only one purpose, and that is for nuclear warfare. And, uh, and so all these uh, pr promises they're making about never pursuing a weapon, they are all revealed as lies when they are developing a long-range rocket capable of reaching this very room one day, not so far off in the future. There's only one reason to develop those rockets. That's to put a nuclear warhead on them. By the way, the deal also allows the arms embargo to eventually end. On terrorism, this deal provides billions, possibly hundreds of billions, to a regime that, according to the Director of National Intelligence, directly threatens the interests of the United States and our allies. And lastly, nothing in the deal holds Iran to account on human rights. Quite the opposite. The Iranian regime is being rewarded for its atrocious human rights record. I know that you said that you've brought up the American hostages in every negotiation, and I, I think we all thank you for that. But for the families of Americans who are missing or detained in Iran, such as that of my constituent Robert Levinson, this deal has brought no new information regarding their loved ones' whereabouts. This deal does nothing for Washington Post reporter Jason, uh, Jason Razian, whose brother Ali is with us here in this room today. In fact, you personally met and negotiated with an Iranian official who, when pressed on Jason's case, lied to the world. He lied to the world by saying, we don't jail people for their opinions. This deal does nothing for Marine Corps Sergeant Amir Hekmati, who dictated a letter from Evan Prison that said, quote, Secretary Kerry sits politely with the Iranians, shaking hands and offering large economic concessions to save them from economic meltdown, unquote, as Iran adds hostages. It does nothing for Pastor Saeed Abedini, whose only crime was practicing his religion. In fact, the only people this deal does anything for directly are the Iranian officials who want to continue to jail and execute their people, who hate Israel and seek to wipe the Jewish state and its people from the face of the planet, who want to spread mayhem throughout the Middle East and continue to help Assad slaughter the Syrian people and perhaps kill some Americans and Israelis while they're at it. Secretary Kerry, I do not fault you for trying to engage in diplomacy and striking a deal with Iran. I don't. I do fault the president for striking a terrible deal with Iran. I hope enough of my Democratic colleagues can be persuaded to vote against this deal and prevent the president from executing, executing it. But even if this deal narrowly avoids congressional defeat, because we can't get to that veto-proof majority, the Iranian regime and the world should know that this deal, this deal is your deal with Iran. I mean yours, meaning this administration. And the next president is under no legal or moral obligation to live up to it. The Iranian regime and the world should know that the majority of members of this Congress do not support this deal and that the deal could go away on the day President Obama leaves office. And in that realm, I wanted to ask about this. If you today are a company that after this deal is signed, 
go into Iran and build a manufacturing facility. And then the next president of the United States lifts the national security waiver or Iran violates the deal. Do the san obviously, do the sanctions apply against that facility moving forward? In essence, if I go in, if a company goes into Iran now after this deal, builds a manufacturing facility of any kind, they build car batteries, and then Iran violates the deal and the sanctions kick back in, will that facility be able to continue to operate without facing sanctions? Senator, um, if a company acts uh, to go in to do business with Iran while the sanctions are lifting, that would be permitted. If Iran violates the deal and if the sanctions snap back, they would not be able to continue doing things that are in violation of the sanctions. Okay, so the reason why it's important, it's important for companies anywhere in the world to know that whatever investment they make in Iran, they are risking it. In essence, they are betting on the hope that Iran never violates the deal, and they are also hoping that the next president of the United States does not reimpose U.S. congressional sanctions by which they would become a sanctioned entity. I have one more specific question about the deal. <coughs> There's a section titled Nuclear Security, and the document states that those who negotiated the deal are prepared to cooperate with Iran on the implementation of nuclear security guidelines and best practices. There's a provision, 10.2, it reads, cooperation through training and workshops to strengthen Iran's ability to protect against and respond to nuclear security threats, including sabotage, as well as to enable effective and sustainable nuclear security and physical protection systems. Here's my question. If Israel decides it doesn't like this deal, and it wants to sabotage an Iranian nuclear program or facility, does this deal, does this deal that we have just signed obligate us to help Iran defend itself against Israeli sabotage, or for that matter, the sabotage of any other country in the world? The, uh, I, I believe that, that, that refers to things like physical security and safeguards. I think the, uh, all of our options and those of our allies and friends uh, would remain in place. Well, <coughs> I guess that's my point. <coughs> if, a, if Israel conducts an airstrike against a physical facility, does this deal, the way I read it, does it require us to help Iran protect and respond to that threat? No. Uh, no. It does not. No. The, the, the purpose of that is to be able to have longer-term guarantees as we enter a world in which cyber warfare is increasingly... Uh, a concern for everybody that if you are going to have uh, a nuclear capacities you clearly want to be able to make sure that those are adequately protected but I can assure you we will coordinate in every possible way with Israel with respect to Israel's concern. So if it, Israel uh, conducts a cyber attack against the Iranian nuclear program well, that, are we obligated to I, help them defend themselves against the Israeli no, cyber I assure attack? You, I, no, I assure you that we will be coordinating very, very closely with Israel as we do on every aspect of Israel's security. And well, that's not how I read this. Well, I don't, see I, don't see way, the... I don't see any way possible that we will be in conflict with Israel with respect to what we might want to do there. And I think we just have to wait until we get to that point. But I do think, Senator, you know, I listened to a long list of uh, your, your objections here uh, about it. But um, there's no alternative that you or anybody else has proposed as to what you... I sure have, Secretary Kerry. I have. And I am confident that the next President of the United States will have enough common sense that if this is being applied properly, if it's being implemented fully, they're not just going to arbitrarily end it. They might want to engage and find a way if they think there's some way to strengthen or do something. But I cannot see somebody just arbitrarily deciding, let's go back to where we were where they're completely free to do whatever they want without any inspections, without any input, without any restraints, without any insight. I don't think any president would do that. Well, even and the status quo is they're already in violation. Before you signed this deal, Iran was already in violation of existing mandates and restrictions, including uh, things they had signed on to in the and past. And this deal brings them back into compliance, Senator. That is exactly the purpose of this deal. Well, this deal brings they them back into compliance. They have to live up to it, compliance. and if they don't live up to it, Every option we have today is on the table. Yeah. So we don't lose anything here. What we, the way we lose is by rejecting the deal. Because then you have no restraints. You have no sanctions. You have no insight. You have no inspectors. You have no diminution of their centrifuges. You have no reduction of their 
of their uh, stockpile. And if you want to just conveniently forget the fact that they had enough fissile material to build 10 to 12 bombs, that's the threat to Israel. I mean, if you go back to that without any alternative other than what, uh, you know, most people think is going to be the alternative, which is confrontation. Nobody has a plan that is articulated, that is reasonable as to how you are going to strengthen this, do something more, when the supreme leader of Iran and the president of Iran and others believe they've signed an agreement with the world. And the rest of the world thinks it's a good agreement. Now, if you think the Ayatollah is going to come back and negotiate again with an American, that's fantasy. Hmm. Uh, you're never going to see that because we will have proven we're not trustworthy. We got 535 secretaries of state and you can't deal with anybody. And that's going to undo a whole bunch of efforts and a whole bunch of things that matter to people in the world. That's what's at stake here.